We are now moving into a brand new session, and it's on relationships. And you'll notice here that we have been focused in on the preparation period, and now we are beginning to go into this new section of Jesus' journey, and that is the one that focuses in on training. Now, this is a very familiar time. In fact, let's write that down. How, how long is the training period for? Three years. Okay, so three years. What I'd like to do is actually break that down in half. I'd like to take the first 18 months, and you can, uh, on page uh, 38 and 39, you can make some notes here uh, where uh, you have some content regarding the insights on relationships. You may just want to draw this uh, diagram down as well. And I'm going to break this three-year period of training into two sections, 18 months and 18 months. And what we're going to do is for the next part of our journey, when you come back every month, we're now going to begin to focus in on each subject one month at a time. So when you come back next month, we'll be focusing on worldview, then generosity. And what we're doing is we're following the life of Jesus month by month by month, basically, what's going on. We're following him chronologically. If we're talking about leadership development, we want to know what's happening in the first 30 years. We now know a little bit better about what happened in those first 30 years. But now that he has received the promotion, go and be a rabbi, be a master teacher. We want to know how did he train his disciples. And then, of course, you can see at the bottom there that we're also going to focus in on something that's not talked about much about Jesus, and that is how did he transition his business well? I mean, you're not going to be in the same position, maybe even in the same business forever. We're all, we will all go through transitions. So how did Jesus go from 12 disciples down to three? And why will he intentionally spend the last six months in transition giving over authority and giving over the business to them. What is he doing during those last six months? So that is where we're headed. Now, let's focus in on relationships. Jesus is now finally finished preparing. It's been 30 years. 90% of his life has been, will be, has been spent on preparing. But now he's ready to accept the idea of being a master teacher, beginning to teach people. And he says, come follow me, come follow me. And to others, it's just come and see initially, and then it eventually becomes come follow me. Eventually, he'll be telling his 12 disciples, ah, oh, you know, come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Or in other words, come work with me. I want just not your life, but also your professional life as well. And so all these things are going to be happening, but what we want to do is focus in on what's happening immediately in the first 18 months. Like, if you finally got your opportunity to finally be able to do what you love to do, and you had the opportunity to be able to just do amazing things, like if you were God's son and could do all sorts of miracles, I would imagine that you would want to say, oh, boom over here, boom over here. Let's, even though I live up here in Galilee, let's go down to Jerusalem, go to New York City, go to anywhere that's big, and let's just do a big boom there. Let's get out on Twitter. Let's, whatever we can do on social media, let's get the word out. We've arrived. Our company is off and running. A big boom. Well, that's not exactly what happened. And in fact, Jesus is going to start calling his disciples to him. And it's really interesting. You'd think that he chose the 12 right here at the beginning. You know, that Jesus would think about that. You know, choose the 12 right away and spend a lot of time with them. No, you know when he chooses the 12? He called Peter, James, and John and all these guys here. But when he actually chose the 12 of them as a team, it happens right here. 
a year and a half into them being together, he finally says, the Bible says he goes up to the mountain and he prays. Now, interesting. A year and a half, Jim Collins, 2,000 years later in his great book, Good to Great, would say, you get the right people on the bus. That's a key to your business. You get the right people on the bus. And what Jesus is doing for the first year and a half is that he's smelling out character and he's smelling out competency. You you know how you do it. You kind of watch these people that you hire. See how they do. I'm not going to give them major leadership thing right now. I want to check out character and competency. And that's what he does for a year and a half. You think he's anxious to get going and really, you know, let's get going. No, he spends time still. He's patient. He spent 30 years in quiet preparation, and he's got this embedded in his DNA. Yes, I'm going to be patient. I'm going to wait. And I'm going to be sure that I select the right people for the leadership part of the organization. 12, he waits 18 months before he selects the 12. And remember, these 12 aren't necessarily men in, who, who really kind of get along. You know, three fishermen, one tax collector, one zealot named Simon, one person that's always questioning like Philip, another person on your team that is always doubtful, you know, like Thomas. Then you got people like John, who's the Lord's favorite, you know, they, they, they seem to always, you know, the, the person whom he loved. You have all these mixture, and you know from reading scripture, right? Jesus' leadership team is really famous for not getting along. They're always arguing with one another. They're bickering. They're having power struggles. So the point being is this. It's not necessarily how well they get along with one another. It's the point of how long do they get along with the boss. They have to have a critical relationship with the boss. So this is what happens. After 18 months, Jesus goes up to the mountain and he prays. And listen to this. And he chooses those whom he wants to be what? With. With. He smelled out character and competency. And the final filter is chemistry. At the end of the day, even though he's got hundreds of people that he could choose from, he chooses those whom he wants to be with. Ah. Now, during this time, one of the best ways to figure out who is really the right people to get on your bus long term is that if you decide, hey, let's do a bunch of miracles and get the ball rolling. I'm so excited. If you do a bunch of miracles, guess what? I'm not sure that's the best way to do it. In fact, when you consider Jesus and what he did in the first 18 months, guess how many miracles he does? I'll tell you. He does exactly two. Two, at least, that are recorded in Scripture. And I don't know what Jesus is thinking. I mean, you'd think he'd be smarter than this. You'd think if you want to get the big mo, the big momentum going, and you've been patient enough. Let's get the miracles out there and big publicity going. But he chooses to do it only two during the first year and a half. And guess where he does it? Does he do it down over there in the south in Jerusalem? No. Here's Galilee. He goes over here. Over here in the far stretches of Galilee to a place called Cana. And he heals the nobleman's son and he changes the water into wine. And guess what he says with the water and the wine? He absolutely he tells the guys who, who were a part of this, Shh, don't tell anyone, even here at the wedding, what happened. He's not interested in attracting people to his business with the big wows. Keep this quiet. Jesus knew a principle that business leaders today need to really understand. You attract people with a wow. Guess how you have to end up retaining them? 
with a wow. If you attract them through relationships, guess how you end up retaining them? Through relationship. How you attract them is how you retain them. This is critical. And Jesus will only do two miracles during this first year and a half because he knows, I do not need to attract people for the wrong reasons. And so, there was one other thing about this, and that is, he's just really, obviously, trying to develop relationships. It's relationships, relationships. That's going to be the foundation of the business. At the end of the day, it's not about profits. We understand that Jesus knows and how he can, he can help us with profits. But when we saw yesterday, ultimately, come work with me. I'll worry about the profit. I'll direct you to the profit. But primarily, I will make you fishers of men. It's all about the people. It's about the people. And he's going to model this for a year and a half. We're going to just get to know the Father ourselves and get to know one another. We'll do a little bit of business along the way, but it's all about the building of relationship for the long term. Now, here's the fascinating thing. You, you open up in John chapter 4, and here's the first thing that it says in John chapter 4, verse 4. He said that he had to go through Samaria. Now, this is really pretty interesting. Here's Galilee, and and down there is Jerusalem in the south. And what would happen is that the Jewish people, whenever they had to go down to Jerusalem, they would do this. They would walk over here. Instead of going 112 kilometers this way, they would go this way. In miles, it's about additional set 20 miles this way. And they literally would come over here to the Jordan River. And would they stay on this side? No, they would actually step over the Jordan River and they would go down the Jordan River. Down the Jordan River. Make sure they don't do anything, step over in here until they got into the south and then climbed over the Jordan River and came into Jerusalem. And this is where we are now in this chapter, verse chapter 4. He's now in Jerusalem the guys that just been following him. And it says that he had to go through Samaria. Well, wh where's Samaria? Oh, this makes sense now why they went along the Jordan River. Samaria is in here. It's in the middle. You see, 500 years ago, the Jewish people were sent out into captivity to Babylon. A number of them were left to cultivate the land, and they brought some Babylonians and Assyrians into the land to just watch over them as they cultivated things. But for 70 years in captivity, the main group of Jewish people were there in Babylon, but there was a, another group group of Jewish people that stayed here, and they began to intermarry. And all of a sudden, their customs and their skin didn't quite look the same. They were a mixed race. When those Jewish people came back from captivity, they were so upset, so disgusted with the fact that they would mix with others that they said, you know what, we're going to form one of the least desirous places and we're going to put them in a quarantine area called Samaria. We'll put them right in here. Wow. And I am leading my leadership team and I am in Jerusalem. And the Bible says he had to go through Samaria. This word for had is the strongest word that the Greek language can have for eating your insides out. It's like he thought to himself, if I'm going to focus in on relationships, it's not just about relationships that look just like me. I'm going to build a team that's going to be diverse. 
I'm going to build a team that loves people of all races. And I, and I have to go through Samaria. I just got to do it. I'm a leader. And if I'm committed to not just be having Galilean guys, if I want to have a global charge long term, and I'm going to tell these guys in three years from now, go into all the world, love people of all races, then I must ex be an example and go through Samaria and have them follow. I'm going to watch who follows me. Because you know what? If they're not interested in diverse relationships, I'm not going to select them as part of my 12. They have to be on board with me on this one. So he goes through, you know the story, right? He goes and walks through Samaria. It's 12 noon. And you know what happens. He sits down at a well. He sits down at a well. And let me just write down this. Notice the intentional steps that Jesus will take now. A woman comes and he initiates a conversation. Yes, with a woman. Now, in their culture, you don't. You don't initiate a conversation with women. They're below you. I mean, this is so sad, so tragic, that women were viewed as less. But you don't want anyone on your team that devalues women. You can watch them for a year and a half to see how they value women, how they treat women. It's, you need to watch it carefully. And this is not just a woman, but this is a Samaritan woman. I mean, she's a different race. And he's doing that. And then to top it all off, Jesus intentionally has stopped here at noontime, told his folks, so worth it, go into the city and grab some food. I'll stay here at the well, which is just probably a mile out, outside of town. But Jesus knows who shows up at noontime. See, the women who have, uh, women who are, are okay in the eyes of others, they come when it's cool, at the beginning of the day, or at the end of the day. But it's the women who come at noon. They're the ones with a checkered past. They're the ones that Jesus would eventually say to, yeah, I know you have five husbands. And the one that you're with is not even your husband. Yeah. This is the kind of woman that Jesus initiates a conversation with. Jesus. You know, none of his disciples are here. And notice what happens here. He starts talking to her. And he asks her for help. Can you help draw some water? I don't have anything. And she says... You know, I'm a, I'm a woman. You don't have, you know, and sh she's blown away that it's not only a case of a conversation, but he's talking to her like, I need your help. Wow. He's offering this dignity to this woman. It's just not like, oh, you know, we got to include women and we got to do it. No, no, no. We are going to treat women with dignity. We're going to ask them for their help, because we need them. And notice that he's, he's sitting down. It's not one of these things where, you know what, let's kind of have a conversation, and I feel kind of good, like, phew, I finally did my little Christian act, and I just kind of helped, you know, and just kind of talked, and phew, good, good, good. No, there's something so powerful about sitting down and talking with someone. I mean, it's powerful. I mean, you know in business. You know when someone's just trying to, they're, sta they're standing up and they're just trying to blow through this conversation, get this conversation done. But it's when you say, let's have a seat. Let's sit down. Let's talk. This is so critical. 
But then he starts talking to her about her past and realizes that she needs help herself. And he offers life to her. He, he discovers that, yes, she has had so many different relationships, and what she needs is life. That would be life, not just drinking from the water, but everlasting water. And he's talking to her and discovering, how can I offer life to this lady? Everyone needs life. And this is what he's doing. He's trying to figure out how to offer life. And then, you know what happens? <laughs> this is hilarious. The, 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 the disciples finally come from town, and they come in and see sees the boss actually talking to this woman. They know exactly who she is, why she's there. And, you know, it, it doesn't take a... a brilliant scientists to figure this out. And the disciples do not bother to ask him any questions. They, they, they don't really want to know. They don't really want to be engaged in this. And Jesus and the woman says, can you stay here? And, and would you please allow me to just go and tell some folks about our interaction and that's exactly what Jesus does. He remains. It wasn't this sense where you got this feeling like, hey, today for our business, we're going to go into the inner city and we're going to kind of do a little diversity day. You know? And, and we're going to kind of paint some houses and I'm going to kind of feel good about this, you know? You don't get the sense at all. They're asking, would you stay? The woman says, would you stay? I just want to tell my friends about this. And she tells them, and literally the entire town comes back out. This is a mess right now, as far as the disciples are concerned. This is just a mess. And now they say, would, the town says, would you stay with us a little bit longer? And the disciples are saying, you know what? I can't believe they were actually going through Samaria. But then the boss is engaged with this one woman. We could have kept it down low, you know. But now she goes back and tells the entire town. The entire town is now out at the well area. And they ask if he can stay. And guess what? He remains for two more days. Unbelievable. Ladies and gentlemen, this will not happen just one time. This will happen a total of eight times over the next three years. Jesus was, had to go through Samaria. And in the last week of his life, when he says he must go to Jerusalem to suffer and die, guess what he does? You're right. He's up in Galilee. In order to go down to Jerusalem, he went through Samaria. It's almost like he was saying in so many words, folks, listen, when you're on my team, even to the very end, we're going to be committed to diverse relationships. This really matters. But it starts with a leader who says, I have to do this. I'll find out who's going to follow me. I'm going to find out who's going to be on my leadership team. But I have to do this. So, we also have one other thing I think it's clear for you to see, that relationships matter. To Jesus, relationships deeply, deeply matter. There are certainly some other relationships in our lives that matter as well. This is a picture of me. I think you can tell which one is me. And over on the right-hand side is my wife, who's dressed up in a Korean wedding dress. Why? Because the, the lady on the left is my daughter-in-law. Her name is June. My son went to Korea 10 years ago to teach English, one-year contracts, and he fell in love with Korea. 
He had graduated from college, didn't know what he exactly wanted to do, except that he wanted to teach. I said, go anywhere in the world, get a worldview, and just enjoy a year teaching and enjoy the people, embrace the people. He now, after 10 years, found a wonderful Christian Korean gal, and he really has embraced her. And I want to tell you that this embrace here means so much to me. You see, my son who's right across from me, he's got his hands gripped on my shoulder there. And to this day, I still feel that grip. Because what they did is that after they got married, instead of going down the aisle and going, Yahoo, Yahoo, which they did, they came over to us and just hugged us. And relationships at home matter. Relationships at home matter. You can see now, most recent picture, my son is on the right there, and June is there in the middle with their six-month-old grandson of mine. He's Bobby. He doesn't look like me. And I love him. My daughter there on the left with her son and her husband behind her. And then uh, our daughter has a total of three children sitting there on the laps of Sharon and I. These relationships matter. To have my wife say, by you going to Pretoria and different places around the world, you're going with me for her to send me, for me to feel no sense of guilt, no sense of we're on the same team together, is so important. These relationships matter. And it's not only about family relationships, but it's also about a small group. You can see me there in the middle with the white hair. Uh, This is the group that I've been spending nearly 20 years with. And uh, if you notice, there is actually one other guy right about here that might look familiar to you. And uh, he's been with me for about 10 years. And we believe that relationships not only matter to Jesus in the context of a small group, but if Jesus was living in relationships, in a small group, so should we. And in fact, Don joined me in this small group at a time in his life when he had a dilemma regarding calling. Do you recall that? And you gave him all sorts of different advice. And I think one of the advice was to perhaps talk with others. But Don, tell us a little bit about the role of our small group in your life at that time in your life? So um, I'll have to apologize to all of you because um, yesterday I left a, it may have seemed like a little flyover as we talked about that experience when I was in the tunnel. And by the way, uh, we call our group the Tunnel Boys because um, all of us at some point or another, in fact, in the 10 years I've been with the group, every single person up there has been or is currently in the tunnel uh, or in the valley. And uh, so what I'm apologizing for is I left a fairly significant part of uh, my tunnel journey uh, that we described yesterday out. And that was uh, my relationship with these guys. And um, my prayer for you, And I would really uh, ask that it be your prayer for you from this point forward is that you be given uh, the amazing gift of a group of people, a group of Christians that you go through life with. Because I can't possibly describe in the next 10 minutes um, the impact that doing life with others according to the way Jesus did life 
and the way the disciples did life. I can't describe to you in that amount of time what it's meant to me and, uh, and what it's meant to every one of these guys because they all feel the same way. So in, um, if you remember yesterday, we talked about uh, my losing my job uh, in 2008. And then uh, I, had a, uh, I was with uh, Robert Half in this job that I absolutely hated from 09 to 12. I was with these guys throughout that whole journey. And throughout that whole journey, a lot of these guys went through the same, some not as serious, some more serious uh, tunnels than I was going through. And um, uh, these guys are just amazing, and I love them. And um, from 1961, when I was born, through 2009, other than having my wife and my kids, um, I did life alone. And that's not how we're built to do life as Christians. We're just not. And so I would, um, I would urge you, uh, beseech you, to aggressively and intentionally seek out a group of others to do life with because it's been so incredibly value, valuable to me. For some odd reason, not everyone in this group is like Don. Uh, in fact, um, uh, there are misfits in this group starting with me. But one thing I got encouraged by was that Jesus had a bunch of misfits that don't necessarily get along that well together, but they trusted me to lead them through it. So, Don, for instance, uh, I, I know that uh, there's one guy here. Uh, let's just say the second guy from the left, Brent. Uh, how, what was your initial reaction to him, and uh, what is it today? So, when I... I would say about two years after I joined the group, we all agreed, that, and by the way, we agree, you know, Steve is our leader, he's the glue that keeps us together, but we have something called a covenant, and um, Steve brought this to us, he said there's four critical elements of small groups that are successful. There's a lot of small groups that spend a whole lot of time on just studying the Bible, and that's great, but they tend not to last long. Uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, groups that you know, they just share their life with each other, but that's all they do and they don't last long. But the four elements of a successful small group, and maybe I'm stealing your thunder, I don't okay. know, is love. That's the first thing, is that we love each other. And these, these points you might want to write down because they're, they're really important and I would suggest that um, if and when you find, and I pray that you do, find that small group to do life with, um, that you look at these four elements and you think about what percentage your small group is going to occupy of these four elements. And that is love, um, the most important co commandment, the first commandment, um, that we love on each other, that we first and foremost love each other. The second is that we learn. And most of our learning takes place um, during our weekly sessions, every morning between, uh, every Sunday morning, between 7 and 8.30. And uh, we study different parts of the Bible. The most growth that I've gotten out of our group is when we study a particular character in the Bible, um, both their incredible strengths, but also their incredible weaknesses and their sinfulness, and the, um, the, the glorious redemption, um, that, uh, the story of redemption that the Bible is. Uh, Joseph, uh, David, uh, these imperfect people who were just, um, just amazing experience to, to live their life uh, and learn about their life. And then the, uh, the third is, uh, help me out. It's to, uh, it's to do. It's to do, yeah. So do we had a couple of instances where we served together. Um, Doing something yeah. together, not just kind of being in a group, but every once in a while, let's go and serve together in some way to do. And how did, how did Jesus tend to do that? He tended to do that in groups of two or three. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah. And, um, and then the final thing is to decide. Uh, and that usually just takes maybe once a quarter sitting down and just saying, how much of a time do we want to spend on loving, learning, and serving? As you guys know, in your, in your relationships at, at work as well as in your relationships at home, unfulfilled expectations are really bad. So why not spend some time deciding what they can expect for the next quarter? And we can do it together. We can decide together. 
Now, do I as a leader lead the way on that? And I have a pretty much an idea of where we want to go? Yes. But I want buy-in on that. So we uh, love, we learn, we do, and we decide. And you've got to have all four elements. And some, sometimes it's, you know, 50% love and 25% learn and just 10% do and, you know, 5% decide. But the point is, every quarter or so, you must have all four of those ingredients going. Otherwise, your small group will die over time. Research has shown. And the part of the small group that I uh, pray that you will find is what I found in Steve. And uh, I'll embarrass him a little bit. Um, I love Steve more than any other man I've ever met, except for maybe my father. And I think I actually love Steve more than my father. You know, we all have our faults. We can all look at our faith and say, oh, I'm not so strong here, and I'm really strong here. And, um, so we're all, we're all fallen people, right? We're all sinful people. Um, and I can tell you Steve is closer to the Lord than I am. And for that reason, um, I tend to share a lot, if not everything, with Steve, and I tend to really take my cue off him. So um, if I ask him to, if I'm grappling with a certain decision or I'm, uh, I'm praying for the successful birth of my granddaughter, for example, when my daughter's uh, expecting in, in uh, June my first granddaughter, uh, I'll ask Steve, Steve, would you, would you pray for my daughter? and her pregnancy. Or, Steve, I'm really grappling with this decision and uh, what I should do, and would, would you pray for that for me? And we have a little um, texting group, sort of like a WhatsApp group, and we're all on that in all of these guys. And uh, we all pray for each other. And um, I follow Steve because, well, first of all, he's my best friend. I love him dearly. Uh, I trust him implicitly, and um, I believe he's closer to the Lord than I am. So uh, I want to be as close to the Lord as he is, but in the meantime, I'm going to continue to follow Steve. And uh, there are times that I'm sure, uh, certainly less, fewer numbers of times uh, than Steve, but there, there are some of those times where Steve asks me, and I share with him my feelings. And, uh, and I know for a fact, because we've been through a lot together, that he takes those things to heart. And so, just in closing, I just want to assure you that uh, these are a bunch of misfits as well. Uh, I didn't even answer your question. Yeah, that, that's fine. That's fine. We'll get to... Uh, Do that sometimes. Just tell uh, literally 30 seconds the difference from yeah. Brent, this guy right Yeah, here. so Brent, um, we did a thing called Going Deeper. So we decided, and we developed a format... And we said, we're going to go through, and, and each person in the group is going to have two days, so two weeks of time where they just go deep and tell us everything about themselves. And I was a little resentful of Brent, because um, Brent kept on using this term inner circle, inner circle, inner circle. And there are certain things I only tell my inner circle. Well, he was clearly telling us he wasn't, that we weren't his inner circle. So I had a little bit of, little bit of, little bit of a problem with that. I said, look, I'm... I'm bearing my soul, and you're talking to us about this inner circle. I didn't say too much. I shared it with Steve. But over a period of months, and today, uh, and that's probably two, three years now, three years now, um, I feel as close to Brent as uh, any, well, closer to Brent than most other men I, I've, I've encountered. Because Brent has gradually opened up. He's gradually revealed himself. <clears throat> and um, I'm just so grateful and for that. Yep. This guy here on the far left-hand side, Todd, uh, he's not with us right now. He's gone through uh, some divorces, several divorces. Uh, it's been very difficult for him to listen and to take instruction from us. And right now, he doesn't want to take any instruction from us, uh, any guidance. We're just loving on him as best we can, telling him the truth about where he's at and being with him, but he doesn't want it right now. And frankly, it's really hurtful and me on many, many levels. And so that's hurtful. This guy here next to me is Jody. Jody is a missionary in the Philippines. Jody needs a book written about him. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he came back from the Philippines, 
and he had no friends, basically, is what he told me. And I said, well, why don't you just uh, kind of hang out with us? And he's just been a, a delight for us. Started These, 300 church plantings in the Philippines. Yeah. yeah. This guy to, uh, in the green shirt, John, used to live in Orlando because we established relationships. He now lives in Tampa, Florida. And he is, um, you know, he comes in to our meetings every once in a while because his grandchildren in Orlando. But every Sunday morning, he's on a computer screen in with us because you can see the computer screen right there. There's a doctor. There's a doctor on that screen. His name is Brian Scott. Brian Scott is 35,000 feet in the air on an airplane at this moment. And he is video conferencing in because he doesn't want to miss our time together. I want to encourage you to see that diverse relationships can matter even in a small group. So, may you value relationships the way that Jesus 